you guys excited for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So our next speaker is Ben Falk. Um, his speech will be over a home and lifestyle response to climate change, peak oil, and the current situation. Ben actually works in northern Vermont in Mad River Valley. He is the founder of um, Whole Systems Design. And so good luck for Ben. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ben Falk, and I, I used to live in a food desert, but now I live in a food paradise. <laughs> Not quite a paradise in, in, in all respects, but it's a really nice place to live. This is what it looks like right now. It's about an hour and a half from here. This is a few days ago, and uh, leaves are changing. And um, this is really the story I was asked to, to come and, and talk to you about um, my business, Whole Systems Design. Uh, and how we work and, and how it developed. And I realized that's really the story of my own lifestyle, which is really the story of my landscape and how I've come to live in and with this landscape, which is really the story in part of how I grew up and what was going on in that landscape. And so I hope to uh, share that story with you here very briefly. Um, as I said, I live in central Vermont. It's 10 acres, and it, it's been there for 10 years. And it's, it's a, what we call a modern-day homestead or a, and a small farm. We have ended up in the last five years or so growing most of our own food and, and producing all of our own heat. And we, we have a very kind of self-reliant and uh, very abundant and productive place that we live. Uh, but it's a lot different than where I grew up. I, I didn't grow up that way. I grew up in the suburbs, wall, wall rats. That's you know, quite a contrast right between there and there. So, um, but I didn't know any different. It was, um, you know, it's just where I grew up. It's what I was used to. And um, it was a place where instead of getting a lot out of our landscape, we put a lot into our landscape and didn't get anything out of it. Right? That's, that's the deal with grass. Right? You, you spend a lot of time and money and energy and you, you cause a bunch of pollution too. And, and you get, you know, you get a flat surface, which is nice for, for throwing some balls around. But, you know, you got a lot of flat surfaces. Suburbs, and you see quite a few here as well. Um, there's plenty of lawn in the world, and it's it's what I knew. I, I knew something didn't feel quite right about it, but I didn't I didn't know much beyond that um, until maybe when I got to um, to high school, I started to see suburban sprawl really taking hold. This is in the '80s when things were really going big on suburban suburban sprawl then, and still continuing, obviously. But this was a this was a big push to basically replace a productive landscape with a landscape of consumption. We, we, took, we, we paved over, literally, for the most part, our, our productive landscape in, in, a, in really less than a generation. That's what, that's what we've done in the United States and, and continue to do in, in, as well in the rest of the world, although a little less so. We're pretty spectacular in our achievement of, of sprawl here. Um, and I had always thought that these farms, you know, which to me, looked like this. At least, uh, you know, where I grew up, there was there was a few strong farms left. Uh, few were left at the end when I was growing up, but there were a lot early on. And I had gone, gotten to college and thought of this as a farm, and this is you know where dairy dairy cows come from, or milk comes from. This is this must be what what it's like where where our pork comes from. This is how pig, pigs are raised, right? You know, looks like they're having a good time. This is, this is where pigs are coming from, right? So. Got to college and, and started looking into global environmental situations and local environmental situations, and quickly was just floored to realize that no, actually, this is how pigs come to us. You know, this is this is how pork is made. That that animals are actually a, a unit of factory, a factory unit of production. That that's that's how the food, if you can call it that, system has come to be. You know, in uh, in the 21st century, and and this isn't how beef. For the most part, you can get beef like this. It's really, really great. Animals have a good life. They're outside. But, but beef, for the most part, for most people, increasingly around the world, and certainly in the United States and North America, this is, this is how beef gets to us, right? It's a feedlot. Again, it's, it's a factory. It's an industrial. That's, that's, that's the logical place that an industrial system moves towards, is, is a factory mass units of production. And you know, we tend to think, of course, chickens. Some farmers do raise chickens this way. They're really they're happy chickens. Right? But chickens don't really come to us that way. For the most part, 99 times out of 100, if you get chicken, meat, or you get eggs, you just go to any store down the road, even in Vermont, this is, this is where 
you know, nearly all of it comes from, right? And so I saw this in college and, and was just shocked that I just, I guess I didn't see these photos. I didn't know. And when I looked into it enough, I was, no, this is true. They're not, they're not putting on a hoax. It's not all photoshopped photos. This, this is the reality. I was, I was surprised and I said to myself, well, I wouldn't treat a chicken that way. I couldn't imagine having chickens like that in my front yard. So it doesn't sound quite right for me to pay someone else to treat chickens this way. Um, so I, I started getting involved a little bit in, in um, kind of resisting this and trying to get you know, better eggs and, and write letters and be part of some nonprofits. Um, and I kept learning about it and realized, wow, well, the environmental, the way we treat animals is a lot like the way we're, we're treating the earth, right? And this is just an aerial view of, of feedlots in the United States. This is the heartland of the United States. Right? This, is, this, is, this is how uh, land use is conducted you know, over, over much of the, of the center of the United States. This is a bunch of feedlots, and this is where the dead zone, this is one of the many starts of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Right, so this is the, the upper source, the non-point source of, of nutrients and toxins that end up making it into the big muddy, into the Mississippi. Every time it rains, all the manure washes off these, these feedlots and all the hormones and antibiotics that we have to pump these animals full with to keep them alive under these conditions ends up in the Mississippi and it ends up in the ocean, right, where, where everything, there's no way. So it all goes downhill and it creates a lot of waste and a lot of toxic muck in the meantime. And of course, when we get into these scales, which I was surprised to learn as well in college, you try to grow one plant, a single species over hundreds of acres or even thousands, and well, one pest can take it all out. It's very vulnerable, it's a very non-diverse way to grow. So this kind of monoculture at, at massive scale necessitates a massive chemical input, right? Pesticide, fungicide, herbicide, um, and fertilizer as well, of course, because there's no ecosystem here. Um, so then we end up in this ironic situation of, of spraying hundreds upon hundreds of toxic chemicals that no one says is fit to eat on our food. And, and that's you know, what we got as a food system for the most part, unless you go out of your way to find other types of, of actual food. And so this was all kind of raining down on me, Depression 101 in college, right? And I was like, wow, this is bad. You know, I gotta get out of here or do something. And, um, but I, I didn't know what to do just yet, and then I, I started. So I started studying land use planning and, and design and architecture. I ended up going to grad school for 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 that those fields later on. But during undergraduate school, I was starting to make these connections and patterns between things like this. Right. So we have people living like this. This has become the, a dominant pattern. They all need stuff, right? We all eat. We all need water. We all go to the bathroom. But we're not producing anything where we live for the most part anymore. So someone else has got to produce all the stuff, right? So this is where all the stuff comes from at massive scale. These are the, the shots that I showed before, similar. So then this is where all this production goes, right? So it's, it's the, the need, the production, and then the, the, the take, make, waste. If you look from the left side of the screen, it's the center pivot. It's the plant production to the make into meat, and then waste, and then get it out, you know, put it in the Gulf of Mexico. So I was, I was taking this all in, as I said, a, a, about 15 years ago in college, and realized, okay, I'm not into killing the earth either. I'm not into treating the creatures badly, and I, I really don't like to see the earth destroyed. It uh, doesn't just doesn't seem that cool. So I want, I want to not participate in that, ideally, not support it, fight against it. That was really the main focus then. And I started drawing some parallels as well in college, uh, and later on to all of the resources needed to propel these kinds of systems, right? This doesn't happen without cheap energy, free-flowing, massive amounts of energy, and it better be cheap or this doesn't work out so well. So fossil energies, ancient energies, aren't well distributed across the globe, so we gotta, we got to secure our interest in them. So we started to make the connections between the kinds of social cost and economic cost, especially just the cost in human lives, uh, never mind the earth, of these kinds of ways of making a living. Just, Again, being on planet Earth, we all eat. And I was I was eating at the time, so I was concerned with this. This is the tar sands, by the way, right? So this is the the oil age part two, the part that's really going to hurt because now it's not liquid fuel. We have to wring it from rock, and and we're well ramped up already to do this over wherever there's tar sands, which is a lot of the, the center of the United States and obviously Canada. This is Alberta. So I left knowing, well, okay, this ain't cool. I don't want to fund it. And luckily, towards the end of college, I, I discovered the field of ecological design and to kind of do something about it, actually be a producer, as well as don't just fight it, don't just resist it, don't, don't take the hard route, 
but maybe produce some of the resources yourself. And finally, I had an opportunity. I found myself on a piece of land after school, and that's really where the story continues. And I said, ah, that looks familiar. I know, I know what a big, nice looking lawn looks, you know, is going to involve. I'm going to have to spend a lot of time and money. And, I mean, I used to mow these things for money. I know it was involved. So promptly ripped it up and, and planted a food system. And I had never gardened before. So I didn't really know what I was doing, but that's the way I learned best anyways. So I just, just got into it, and a lot of food started coming out of the ground. And, and I was like, wow, this is actually pretty cool. This isn't, this isn't just something I kind of have to do. I was kind of going into thinking, well, I should do some of this. I should contribute to my self-being on the planet and being an eating, an eating human being. And, uh, but then I started to really, really like it, and I was kind of surprised by that. It started to be really enjoyable. We all of a sudden, within a few years, had more garlic than we can eat. We started giving away and trading garlic. And then that kind of brought me in touch with a bunch of friends and neighbors. And all of these other benefits started cascading downward. And I realized, you know, maybe I'm going to stay on this piece of land for a while, which wasn't the idea. I've now been there. I'm in my, entering the 11th year as of September. So I started planting trees. And this is probably about seven years ago, thinking, well, this is, I like this. This is, this is way cooler than all the school and stuff I was in. So, and I was learning a lot, of course. So I started putting trees in the ground, we kept ripping up more lawn, more grass, because there was a lot of it. Putting more food in the ground, and then we realized, well, this food's so great, we're saving a lot of money, it's really, really healthy stuff, and this is a lot of fun, let's start storing it for the winter, so we started making closets full of squash and all sorts of stuff. And, which isn't actually a smart way to store squash, by the way, you want to pack it all together. But, you know, that's how, that's how I learn stuff. I try, I try, I try, I try everything. And, um, I have a healthy disbelief of what I read, and, you know, for better or for worse. And um, so we started to, about five years into it, realize that this is not what we, this isn't what we bargained for. I never realized that when I would go out into the yard to pick some food for dinner, I would fill a basket with, you know, most of the week's produce that I need. And I'd sit there and marvel at the plants and how beautiful all the plants were, and how beautiful the produce and the fruits that the plants made were. I just, I wasn't signing up. I didn't know that that's what was going to happen. So all of these things started kind of cascading in. That was one of them. And then one of the other things was just how good it was all going to taste. You know, again, that's not why I got into it. I didn't get into it because I was a foodie. I'm kind of a foodie now. But I wasn't a foodie when I started gardening. The gardening will make you a foodie, for sure. And maybe small-scale farming will as well. Um, and everything, just when you eat really fresh food, I mean, when, I, when the salad's still breathing fresh, which is what happens with us, if we pick the salad, it won't be days old or weeks old or hours old, it'll be like 10 minutes, 5 minutes, zero food miles, you know. You know, hey honey, can you go out and pick the arugula? Okay, it's in, let's eat. <laughs> two minutes, two minutes old food. And that stuff tastes really, really, really good. You can't buy food like that, even from a local farmer. So, so now I'm getting to be really a pretty hardcore foodie because this is just so good. It's free and it's fun. You know, I feel like I'm actually doing the thing I started out to do, which is be a little bit of a producer in this whole world. And all of a sudden, also realizing this amazing cascade of diversity, all this food I never realized you could eat. I didn't know it was food, things like honeyberry and shiitake and tatsoi and bok choy and, you know, duck eggs and arugula and all these amazing, this cornucopia of options that I just, I mean, don't see it in the grocery store. I didn't eat it growing up, that's for sure. And some of this stuff's amazing. So arugula can grow through the whole winter. Even in Vermont, we were eating massive arugula salads in March with snow on the ground. We called it the endless arugula bit. And just all these discoveries as we went. And then growing food actually made me realize that there's food all around us. I mean, I just walked out for five minutes when I got here and I found, you know, apples and, uh, and hickory nuts right here. You know, this one was hitting me in the head when I was walking my dogs in the woods. And apples also, this one did actually hit me arm. Um, it's falling. And, and there's just food everywhere. And you start seeing that, especially in rural areas and even in suburban areas, when you start growing food, there's an interesting thing about gardening is it opens your vision to a whole lot that's not gardening. That's also actually not just food related, but cultural. I'll mention that sex. So we would go around and see all these thousands of pounds of apples literally rotting within a mile on my road and take my old truck and shake them and collect like 500 pounds of apples in an hour and make hundreds of of dollars worth of cider that we wouldn't buy because it would just be too expensive. And then we, so we kept getting into it more and more. And one of the things I also didn't realize was how, you know, enjoyable and, and how in shape it keeps you to keep a good sized garden. I was always into being really active and 
I always felt like, okay, I could go run around the block in circles. That kind of seems like a hamster. Maybe I can actually get something done, <laughs> done for the process. You know, like at least, I don't know, I'll spin a turban or do something. And maybe actually I could grow some food. So while it's not very cardiovascular, which sometimes I still need to, I'd like to get anyways, uh, it's, it's very physical, and that's, that keeps, there's a certain level of vigor that comes out from that. Does anyone know, if you spend a day in the garden, you sleep really well, and you just, you just feel good. Um, I'd always just wanted to be outside as much as possible. That was the primary criteria, I think, of, of my life. And so it's kind of morphed into gardening, and we started growing a lot more potatoes, and again, on a storage piece, we dug a hole in the ground. They call this a clamp. It's a, probably a 10,000 or 20,000 year old technology or more. Just, dig a hole and put food in it and come back in the spring, it's pretty simple. But it can work really well if you do it just right. And the amazing thing is that the food's much better when taken out in the spring than when you put it in. It ages in just a certain way. And the best potatoes I've ever had were, were this, for sure, before we had a root cellar. And so uh, everything we were doing was, was getting, was successful for the most part. We'd have some failures like the squash closet, you know, but um, <laughs> we salvaged most of that. But, we were met with a very high degree of success, more than in most of my life. So I was, I was kind of emboldened to keep trying all sorts of stuff. And when people said, oh, you can't do that here, or no one does it, I didn't take it very seriously. Or if something seemed to make sense, um, I didn't take it too seriously. And so I tried. I, I saw photos of people growing rice in northern Japan, rice patties, under snow. And I figured, well, that could be Vermont. Let's try to grow rice. Rice would be great to have on this beat up old hill farm that has basically zero to one inches of topsoil. Like it's, it's, it's just a denuded like most of the world is what it is. It's not ag land. Uh, so it's a great test site. We call it the Whole Systems Research Farm because of that. So we started to make rice patties and we seeded them out. And much to our own disbelief, we started to get rice. And this amazing, beautiful crop started to grow. And we got all these rice patties. You know, how that happen? I mean, it was a bit of work, but it just happened. It really happened on its own, too. I and mean, we just helped it along. And you know, this is all this beautiful crop develop and this, this golden rice, which by the way, you cook and when you eat fresh rice, I didn't realize I've always been eating stale rice my whole life. It doesn't take 40 minutes to cook or 30. It takes 10. I burn the first you know, dish I made. Um, it's, it's still hydrated. So people caught on to this and started coming like, how, how do you do this? You know, this seems like a really cool thing to do. So we, we literally, now we've brought probably hundreds of, on hundreds through, through these patties. And just check out some of the other innovations we're doing as well, old, ancient innovations mostly. Um, and you know, people would come from local colleges and want to help us plant the rice. I'm like, oh, that's cool, yeah, help, yeah. help us plant the rice. Now it's even this <laughs> So they get to learn about it. It's just great. We get to meet all sorts of people from really all over the world. And, and some of those were actually Bhutanese refugees that moved to Vermont. Well, they didn't move, they fled to Vermont. And um, they sought asylum from Bhutan, and they were you know, totally bummed out because they don't see, they don't have their native land use. Most of the world lives on rice, and rice feeds the world it's more than any other crop by far, has been for 4,000 years at least. And these guys have grown rice for generations. So they were elated to hear about someone growing rice. They came out, we chatted with them about what we knew, but we're like, Hey, wait a minute. They wanted to, their, their facilitator came out to want to have them learn from us. And by the time, after five minutes, they said, No, you, you guys need to tell us how to do this. They've been growing rice for, for probably 5,000 years in their families. Uh, we've been growing it for three <laughs> at that point. And uh, so we got connected with them, and now they're actually growing a large amount of rice as part of their livelihood in Burlington's North End. We, we kind of helped them set that up a little bit. But they'll probably be teaching us a lot more about it already. So we started getting into all parts of our food system and, and, and have ended up really growing the vast majority of our own calories and not as a full-time job. I'm not a farmer. I do have a small farm, but I make my living uh, well now selling books about what we do and teaching courses about it and, and design, helping other people with whole systems design set up systems like this. They're really just freedom systems. I mean, they're just land freedom systems is all they are, um, where people have a higher degree of self-reliance and produce some of their own basic resources you know, other, eat, other eating human beings and people that need to stay warm. So we started getting a lot of, um, a lot of eggs and the ducks started reproducing themselves. This is Coco Chanel and she's pretty amazing. <laughs> she made a new, ah, multiple new ducks that year. And at some point, in the, in the few years in, the, pro the system starts to actually propagate itself, which was this magical thing to see. It wasn't just, because we focus on perennial systems. That's kind of the idea behind permaculture. It's not just annuals. And so you start getting these perennial systems like animals and, uh, animals and um, shrubs and tree crops in the ground, and they start doing stuff you never even expected, and you can leave them after a few years, and they start raining food down on you quite literally. 
the, the ducks are amazing to live with. They put them in the patties and they actually weed out, they eat every plant but the rice. It's an ancient system. The duck rice synergy is at least thousands of years old. They can't digest the rice because it's too high in silica. They poop it out and end up weeding and fertilizing the rice patty perfectly. And this is old, this is, this is cultural, intercultural learning, right? Because we're doing an Asian system here in Vermont. So there's a, there's a major cross-cultural thing going here. Uh, we, don't, we don't grow rice, but not, we just started to in northern in New England. Um, but rice, again, is throughout most of the world. It's the only successful, long-term, annual agricultural system in the world, besides for taro, um, of course, because it's water-based. And then we start having even more eggs, and everyone, all these young folks want to learn about how to do this stuff, how to, how to they start supporting our wood for us, you know, these are interns from the university. They're, they're supposed to be getting a bachelor's degree, but they're like, well, we want to know how to heat our home when we get out of here, and do some of these basic things, and we end up heating our home on two cords of wood, and it cooks for us, and heats all of our hot water, too, um, bakes, you know, just an amazing thing. It's not nothing new under the sun, but it is new because people don't do this anymore. So much of this is reclaiming old knowledge. That's a big part of this. There's some new stuff, but not too much. Um, seeing hazelnuts come off the plants was a new experience, and getting shiitake mushrooms, which we get massively, and people want to come and help learn how to do shiitake mushrooms. So they, they help get the mushroom logs, which are just wasted normally in the landscape. And now in the last few years, the fruit yield has really started to come in. Our hardy kiwis, this is a few weeks ago. Our peaches, kiwis, and plums. Everyone's ready for lunch, I <laughs> Hopefully it'll look like this. And uh, this is some of the plums, which you know, this is the kind of food you just can't get in the store. So we started to move into some of the other aspects. This is three weeks ago. And that's like $10,000 worth of nutrients. Really, if you, if you calculate per nutrient, it'd be more like $20,000 of nutrients. So you can't buy nutrients like that anymore in the current food system. Uh, or you, gotta, you have to get like 40 apples for one apple that our grandparents had, like the research has shown. Yeah. We started to get into the health side of it a bit because we noticed the health increases in our own life. Growing medicinal herbs, growing a lot of preventative medicine. This is a bowl of medicine. I mean, these are, these are um, teas you know, that we dry in the winter, calendula and anise hyssop and a bunch of others. Started to realize, well, maybe medicine, medicine certainly can be beautiful. Maybe medicine should be beautiful. At least a bunch of it certainly can be. And coming into contact with this, these are all different super fruits and foods that we grow, sea berry. And when breakfast starts looking like this every day, we just, we stop getting sick too often. And if we got a cold, it wouldn't last very long. And like, that's strange, because I got into this not for something, but to get away from something. Like, this is what I was trying to avoid. I was trying to not fund the destruction, not be part of it that much. That led me into being a producer. You know, it was the, the mistreatment, the abuse of not just the earth, but the abuse of other living things that I, you know, I was moving away from that and I didn't realize what was gonna end up happening was I was gonna be getting close to the best lifestyle I can think up for myself. I guess I did think it up, I was moving away from something bad. Ending up in a place where now you walk out the yard into abundance and deliciousness and just um, a, a situation that was really unexpected. And I started to realize the amazing thing about this is you can do, we, not all of us can do all of this, but many of us can do most of it. For most of human history, most of humanity has grown most of their own food. This is the oldest thing going. We're all going to eat today. Right? Where does that food come from? We all, you don't have to convince a politician to do anything to do this. We actually, in fact, we have to do a lot of this ourselves, most of it. And that's ultimately, it's really just the empowering landscape, the empowering landscape, and the empowering lifestyle for me. Um, because it's up to all of us to do this ourselves. We don't have to have anyone else's help um, but the neighbors or some friends. You know, we don't need large, huge organizations to actually undertake this very basic challenge that's a perennial challenge that's existed throughout all of humanity. So that's, that's part of my story here, and thanks for listening. If you should learn more, this book was published this year by Chelsea Bean. It's about our, our systems. Wow. So, thanks. Yeah.